in the book of John. So they, they're super excited that I'm doing this, but really they're not because I'm going to go through it all in the ESV and they're memorizing it in the NIV. And so they're like twitching uh, as, I, as I do this. So um, they're going to be scowling at me the entire, the entire time it'll take us to go through the book of John. But um, it, we're doing longer sections in this. So I know usually we stand up and we'll read it together. But if you would, if you can, stand with me. I'm going to have uh, different folks just read the section for us because they are longer and it's kind of tough to all drone on together. So if you would stand as we get into the Gospel of John, uh, Elder Matt is going to... Um, read for us. It titled today is The Logos Among Us, and it is John 1, 1 through 18. I don't know what happened to my 18 there. But. Are we on, Jackson? Okay, here we go. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of, of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, but his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Amen. You can grab a seat. Thank you, Matt. And, um, yeah, I forgot to mention, I'm not putting the words up there because it is a long section title. It's a bunch of slides. So this uh, probably for most of the book of John, if you have your Bibles, it's good to open those up to John chapter 1. Regardless of your translation, it'll be useful for you because we're going to be covering that whole first section title uh, called the prologue. So we're in John chapter 1. Um, and it'll be useful for you to reference that. I'm not going to have too much up on the screen there for you. So let's just open up in prayer if we could. Lord, you are good. I thank you for your presence in our lives. I thank you for your word that you have given to us. It is so clear, Lord. I thank you for these inspired men that, have, uh, that, that were, you've used to give us this word. I pray, Father, that you would call us to yourself and that you would clarify your call, that you would bring illumination to all things in the way we should walk and that we would walk in obedience. Keep me from error today, Lord. Let these words be yours. And let the hearts of the hearers uh, be opened to receive your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so excited to be starting this, uh, the Gospel of John here. It's going to take us a long time to get through, so dig in. You ready? So a couple first, uh, since we're starting John just now, first couple quick just facts about it in case you're not familiar. Most of you probably are, but John, the author of this gospel, was the younger brother of James. He was one of the 12 that followed Jesus, the 12 disciples. They were both fishermen by trade. Uh, they worked for their father, Zebedee. They were the sons of Zebedee. Their mother uh, is named Salome. She also appeared to have followed Jesus, uh, and very likely that Zebedee was a guy who had some money, and Salome probably financed some of Jesus' ministry. He had several women that cared for him and financed much of that ministry over the course of those three years. And John, along with uh, his brother James and Peter, they made up the inner circle of Jesus. You know, he had the 12, but then he had the three that he would often take with him uh, for, I don't know, special assignments, if you will. The healing of Jairus' daughter, for example, the transfiguration on the mountain. That was just those three and Jesus. And John, being the younger brother of 
James, we can assume he was fairly young when he was following Jesus on those three, three and a half years of ministry, uh, possibly late teens, early 20s at the latest, uh, because the Gospel of John was written sometime around 90 AD. So this is 60 years after Jesus' crucifixion and ascension that John actually writes this. So uh, assuming he wasn't living to like 120, he was probably fairly young when he was following Jesus. Um, interestingly, James, John's brother, was the first of the disciples to die. He was martyred. Acts uh, chapter 12 tells us that he was martyred by Herod. And John, the author of this gospel, is the last of the 12 disciples to die and the only disciple to die a natural death, according to church tradition. Uh, all the others were martyred, with the exception of Judas, who took his own life. The book of John is one of four Gospels. Um, you know, people who question, well, why? Why do they just tell the same story four times over? We have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then we have John. But John kind of stands alone because Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic Gospels because they follow the same general uh, chronology. They, they tell the same stories. Uh, they have a lot of overlap with the miracles that they record, with the sayings of Jesus, even word for word in some places. Uh, you know, being the same. John stands alone in the catalog of the New Testament. It has the least overlap out of, uh, it has five miracles. It only has, depending on how you count, seven miracles while Jesus is uh, before the crucifixion, seven miracles while he's alive. And five of those aren't recorded in any of the other Gospels. Um, and so it is a really a rich supplement to the synoptic Gospels. Uh, many of the stories that we have, like him changing water to wine, don't occur anywhere else in the Bible. As we go through this gospel, we're going to touch on some of the recurring themes that we see. Like, for example, John loves to play with light and dark imagery. You see it in the gospel. You see it throughout his epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John as well. We'll talk a little bit about the structure of the narrative. John, will find, was much less concerned with the chronology of Jesus uh, as he was more concerned with showing who Jesus is. Um, and today... We're going to start our study of John's gospel with this section known as the prologue. That's that first section title that you have in your Bibles. And from a literary perspective, you know, the English teacher in me says, okay, well, what's John doing here? Well, it's a prologue, right? It, it touches on all the major themes that John's going to be bringing out throughout the 21 chapters of his gospel. Uh, he includes, you know, he touches on the deity and the pre-existence of Jesus, uh, on the humanity of Jesus, on the role in, uh, Jesus' role in creation and salvation, the call for faith in Christ as the way to salvation, the power of grace over law. Uh, all of that is previewed right here in these first 18 verses. And uh, I, like I said, I went with a bigger section than usual today. Um, and we're going to cram a lot in there, uh, but I can't cram it all in there. So we're actually going to spend probably at least two weeks just on those first 18 verses. So uh, I took the big chunk, but we're going to kind of follow a couple different threads through there. The actual narrative begins in verse 19. Uh, that's when John starts telling the story. So here we go with the prologue. Um, and again, if you have your Bibles open, that'll be great, because um, I'm going to be taking us around to a couple different spots. So as we open up this gospel, we find that John is opening up Jesus Christ to us. And as I said before, John's gospel is unique in the Bible because it doesn't follow the same chronology. That's because, as I said, John's less interested in recording a chronology of Jesus and more concerned with structuring his narrative in a way that reveals who Jesus is. And so in the prologue here, John is unfolding the nature of who Jesus is. He's going to provide eyewitness evidence that affirms and confirms what Jesus says about himself and what John himself says about Jesus and what he came for. And he starts off with three little words uh, that would mean a lot to anyone familiar with the Old Testament, right? He starts out with, in the beginning. Now, actually, it's only two words in the Greek. En arche is the Greek. En arche, in the beginning. And that is interesting because those are the exact same words that start the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. Now you say, well, time out. I thought the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. True, it was originally written in Hebrew. But it was translated into Greek at a certain time, I think sometime around the 3rd century B.C. And so for 200 years, 
before Jesus was born, most of the Jews had access to the Septuagint, to the Greek scriptures. Uh, the, the New Testament writers, primarily, by and large, they quote the Septuagint. They, they quote the Greek Old Testament. So what John had access to, what uh, most of the Jews, a lot, many of the Jews didn't even speak Hebrew uh, by that time, uh, what they had access to was the Greek, New Test, uh, Greek Old Testament. Excuse me. So when he starts out with enarche, that's exactly the same first two words of the book of Genesis. And you say, well, that's interesting, but so what? You know, um, it must have been intentional. It has to be intentional that John does this, that he starts the same, with the same words as the book of Genesis. And why does that matter? I mean, was John just ripping off the Jewish scripture? Could he not think of an original opening? I don't, I don't think that was the case. See, John is creating a very intentional parallel between the creation account in Genesis and his revelation of Jesus Christ. And so what's the significance of that? In a sense, John takes up the story of creation that the Jews would be familiar with, and he reframes it in light of the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, here's what you know to be true about how God created the world. Now let me zoom in a little and fill in some of those details for you that you might be missing. It's been said that the Old Testament is Christ concealed and the New Testament is Christ revealed. And, and that's exactly what John begins to do here in this prologue is reveal the Christ, the anointed one, the promised one, the savior of the world. And now John gives him a new title. It's a word that the, the Jews and the Greeks were familiar with, but John takes it and uses it in a little bit of a new way. And that word is logos or logos, depending on how you trans. Uh, uh, pronounce that. It's translated here and in probably all of your Bibles there as the word word. In the beginning was the word, an arche lagos. And I'm going to be using that word lagos a lot today, so get ready. Um, that word lagos is where we actually get our English word logic from. And it wasn't just a word, it was really kind of a whole concept, this, this idea of the Lagos, this Greek idea. It wasn't a Hebrew concept, it was a, it was a Greek concept, a, a part of Greek philosophy. The Greeks shared this general idea of creation with most of the world cultures that before creation, there was chaos, right? And the Lagos brought order out of the chaos, in essence, the logos was the logic of order that is creation, right? The Greek word cosmos, we say cosmos. The Greek word cosmos, which refers to the earth and everything that's created, it literally means harmonious arrangement and order. So the cosmos is only the cosmos because it's in order. And the thing that brought that to order was the logos out of the chaos, right? You can build a poem out of that or something. Um, and so when John writes, in the beginning was the Lagos, the Greeks would have been able to nod their heads. They would have been like, yeah, I agree with that. In the beginning was the Lagos. And even in verse 3, when John says that the Lagos is responsible for all things that exist, they'd probably still be able to nod their heads and say, yeah, because they believe that the Lagos created order in the universe. And so they're not nece there's not necessarily anything novel in John saying, in the beginning was the Lagos, and the Lagos was responsible for bringing order into the created universe. But John's up to something here because he doesn't stop there. See, in the Greek philosophy, the Lagos was an abstract force that brought order and harmony to the universe. It was impersonal, it was abstract, it was ultimately unknowable in a personal way. But John says, look, this Lagos that was in the beginning, it was God. It was theos, is the Greek word for God. See, what makes John's claim unique isn't what the Lagos does so much as who the Lagos is. And when John says, in the beginning was the Lagos and the Lagos was Theos, he's drawing us back again to Genesis, which uses the exact same Greek in the Septuagint, which says, in the beginning, God. And so in a sense, John is highlighting the identity of God as the creator Yes, God is the creator, highlighting it, underlining it. But now he's connecting the Lagos. This is new. This is, uh, this is something new. He's connecting the Lagos to that creative act. And in a way, John actually, I love this, he, he brings a message to both the Jews and the Greeks, to the whole world in essence. Uh, because to the Jew, he says, hey, you know that Theos, the God in Genesis who created everything? 
It's the logos. And then he says to the Greek, he says, hey, you know that logos you're familiar with that brings order out of the chaos? It's theos. It's the God of the Jews, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's kind of similar to what Paul does, if you're familiar with the Mars Hill sermon, when he gives in Acts 17, when he says, what you worship as something unknown, I now proclaim to you. He says, hey, this logos that you're not so familiar with, let me tell you about the logos. And that's where we're going to be today. Um, John goes on in verse 14 to say that this logos, he actually became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He's saying to the Greek, he says, this logos isn't some abstract, impersonal force. It's a he. And you could know him because he revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? And to the Jew, he says, the God of our fathers, the invisible God who dwells in our midst, well, guess what? He came. He came in the flesh. He came to that which was his own, to the very world that he created, John says, but his own people did not receive him. And so this prologue is really about John introducing Jesus. And as I, I read through these verses, I made a note of, of what John is saying about the Lagos, different characteristics he gives to the Lagos. So I have those 10 up there, 10. I know it's a lot, you know. So you could put those up there, Elijah. Next slide. I'm going to leave them up there uh, so that you guys can see them. I know they're kind of small, but we're going to run through all of those. I'm going to touch on them briefly, okay, because it would be unbearable if I probably spent a lot of time on each. But the first thing we see is that the Lagos was in the beginning, right? Verses 1 and 2 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And this speaks to the eternal nature of Jesus Christ. So the Lagos is, number one, he is eternal. And John makes a point of the fact that he wasn't created. Although Jesus as a man was born, as the Lagos of God, he has always existed. And we need to pause there for a minute because that's a big deal that John's writing here. God is eternal. Okay, no problem there. The Jews would know God is eternal. That's not something John would have to prove to his Jewish audience. Deuteronomy 33, 27 says that the eternal God is our dwelling place. Psalm 102, 12, but you, O God, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. Isaiah 40, 28, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the eternal God, the creator of all things, existent outside of time, present before time even began. But in his gospel, John ascribes this same quality to the Lagos, the Word. And that's new. He's saying that the Lagos is eternal, without beginning and without end. Now next, John makes two interesting claims with some serious implications. Second and third up there. The Lagos was with God, and the Lagos was God. In verse 1 again, it says, And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now John has already ascribed an eternal nature to the Lagos. And an eternal nature is, you know, that's kind of God's thing, right? So it's not too big a jump for him now to claim that the Lagos is, in fact, God. And that makes sense. But if God's God, track with me here, if God is God, well, then how can the Lagos also be God? Especially if the Hebrew God that we're talking about in Isaiah 45.5 says, I am the Lord, and there is no other besides me. There is no God. Well, John just introduced another God. Or did he? Remember how John mirrors the phraseology of Genesis in order to bring us back there? Well, if we go back to Genesis, look at Genesis 1.26, God, the theos, the singular God, the one God, speaks in the plural when he says, we should make man in our image. And John captures that plurality here in his gospel perfectly when he says that the logos was at once with God but he also was God. So let me, let me see if I can make sense of that. These are important points in understanding the doctrine of, of the Trinity. Um, there's, there's, I had originally in here, you know, all the different heresies, the Trinity, Trinitarian heresies and stuff, and Sarah said it was actually painful to listen to, so, so I took those out. 
so thanks to our later. But uh, the point that John makes is that the word wasn't a separate God, okay? But he was one in nature with God. But John also says that the word was with God at the same time that he was God. Is that, uh, I hope that's making sense. Because listen, if he's with God, that means God's still there. That means there's two people there, right? There's God and there's the Lagos with God. God, God didn't disappear to make way for the Lagos as some new expression or new iteration of God, right? That's actually a heresy known as modalism. I did keep one heresy in there. Uh, That's actually a heresy known as modalism, which says that God the Father stopped existing uh, when he became the Son. And then the Son stopped existing when he became the Holy Spirit, that God has simply expressed himself in different persons. That's not a proper understanding of the Trinity. And if that was true, then how could the word be God, but also with God at the same time? Nope. John says that God was still there and he existed with the Lagos. But the Lagos was eternal and was himself God. And I know it's a little bit dizzying. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not saying that the Trinity is something we'll ever fully understand. I don't think John's just rambling though. I think there's precision in his words and this is why we believe what we do about the Trinity and why we ultimately have to leave a certain tension and mystery uh, in our understanding of it. God is one God but eternally existing in a loving unity of three equally divine persons. Amen? We'll leave that there. So our first three claims about the Lagos, he is eternal. He was with God in the beginning, and he is God. Next, the Lagos is creator. Verse 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 10 says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Again, if we go back to Genesis, it was God, the Theos, who created. And so in claiming that the world was made through the Lagos, John is again ascribing deity to the Lagos. Now, I know uh, 10's a lot to cover, so I'm going to be going through them quickly. Don't, Don't stress out. All right, here we go. Fifth, John shows us that the word, the Lagos, has life in him. Verse 4 says, in him was life. Uh, Sixth, are we up to six? All right, six, the Lagos is light. Verse four goes on to say, and that life was the light of men. And we see light throughout this gospel. Seventh, the Lagos is victorious or supremely powerful. Where do I get that from? Verse five, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Number eight, the Lagos is glorious. Verse 14 says, we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son from the father. And again, these are all, as we look at these, I mean, we have to wrap our heads around the fact that these are all attributes of God. And John is building toward his crescendo in verse 14, where he finally reveals that the Lagos, who shares all these same qualities as God, actually became flesh and made his dwelling among us in the person of Jesus Christ. But before we get there, let's just look at some of these attributes we just listed. First, John says the Lagos was life, and there's two ways we can understand that. First, life in the sense of the force that just animates matter, right? You're alive, your, your heart's beating, you're breathing, um, you know, you're metabolizing, you're, that you're, you're alive. That's the essence of what we call living. That animating power was in the word which is eternally existent. And that makes sense since, since the Lagos created everything, he brought everything to life. It makes sense that life is in him. But as we said, John is is reframing a traditional understanding of God in the context of Jesus as the revelation of God. And so the second way we understand this is John talking about the new life that comes through the work that Jesus accomplishes on the cross after the eternally existent Lagos becomes flesh. And I think the second way is really the point that John's making here. You know, how do I know that? Well, I look at some other things that he wrote. John 540 He says, you refuse to come to me that you may have life. John 10, 28, he says, I give them, this is Jesus speaking, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Uh, John 10, 10, I think I skipped that. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. 1 John 5, 11 and 12, he says, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in the Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now, the people 
that Jesus is talking about and that John is talking about, they're already alive, right? Their, their hearts are breathing, they're sentient, moving beings, right? So what is this life if it's not the animating force that we call life? And the answer to that, I think, is really important because as Christians, that's a central point of our faith, right? That there is life beyond just the living, moving, breathing, beating heart life, and that life uh, comes through Jesus Christ. Because even though we are all alive, every human being ever born is spiritually dead. And the only way that the Spirit can come alive is through Jesus Christ. In fact, that life isn't merely granted to us by Jesus. It is, in fact, in Jesus Christ that we have life. John 14, 19, Jesus tells his disciples, because I live, you also will live. And it's helpful for an illustration. You know, we see a shadow of this. We did a series, one of my favorite series we've done was on the shadows, where we looked at Old Testament stories and looked at how that related. We'll have to do like a shadows part two or something. Uh, But there's a shadow of this truth in Noah. You know, only those in the ark were saved. And Jesus is that ark, right? And, And life and salvation are in Jesus Christ. He is the vessel of life. Next, John says that that life is the light of men. And like I said, if you look at John's epistles, you're going to see him frequently using uh, contrasting light and darkness uh, as, as imagery to express the truth of God. And it, and it works great as a symbol uh, for obvious reasons because we look at, well, what does light do? Well, it exposes things. Darkness uh, makes it possible to conceal, but light exposes. You walk around in the dark, what, you, you can get lost, right? Uh, You can trip over something. You can hurt yourself. But the light shows us the way that we should walk. The light illuminates the obstacles. That's a spiritual truth, right? The light keeps us in a place of safety. And John, I believe, intends all these things when he says this. In verse 9, he writes that the true light enlightens everyone. And I, I stopped on that one for a little bit because, you know, not everyone chooses to believe in Jesus Christ. So when he says the light enlightens everyone, what does he mean? And I believe in a sense, uh, he's talking about the fact that Jesus is the general revelation to all mankind. When uh, theologians talk about general revelation, they say they talk about those things that are observable and accessible to the, to the human mind, that we don't need any kind of divine uh, you know, interaction to understand. And you, we look at creation, that's what uh, Paul's talking about in Romans 1 when he talks about creation testifies to God. And Jesus Christ came in the flesh. That is a general revelation. All people, it's historic fact Jesus Christ existed. And so in that sense, he is a general revelation, a light to all mankind. I'll talk about more about that in a minute. But see, because before Jesus, the Bible says that nobody had ever seen God. You know, there are appearances of God. Moses sees there's angels of God in the Old Testament. They call them theophanies. They believe that those are um, manifestations of the Lagos, actually, um, because God is invisible. You know, but how many times have you, have you heard somebody say, well, if God is real, why doesn't he just show up here and kind of prove, us, prove to us all that he's real? You know, and, and what we should say to that is, he did, right? He, he showed up in the person of Jesus Christ, and we have eyewitness testimony to this fact, written down right here. Confirmed, corroborated by several witnesses, by other miracles, the proof is there. But John tells us that this Lagos has life in him. And that life, that that spiritual life that's offered to those who believe, it's an illuminating light. I don't know about you, but you know, that was my experience when I came to the Lord it was like a light went on. You know, they talk about like those light bulb kind of moments. It was like a, a, say literal, but I guess it's a metaphorical, I don't know. A light went on and suddenly I could see. It was like all the world had kind of been half concealed in shadow. And when I put my faith in Jesus Christ, suddenly my eyes were opened and I could see. Suddenly the path was clearly illuminated and I didn't have to stumble around in the dark anymore. So why doesn't everyone see the light? You know, if it's that easy. Well, John explains later in chapter 3, he says that the light has come into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. 
For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. And unfortunately, some have closed their eyes to this light. But just because you close your eyes, you realize the sun could be out shining. If you close your eyes, the sun doesn't stop shining. You don't see its light, but it doesn't mean the light's not there. All right? It doesn't mean the light has gone out. Jesus is the light of the world, whether people acknowledge him or not. It is an objective fact. Next, we said that John also ascribes glory to the Logos. Number eight, he's glorious. We can spend a lot of time, I think, digging into glory, talking about what glory is, but one of the definitions when you look up glory um, in the Greek lexicon, it's a splendor or brightness, as in the light from the stars or the sun. I know that's interesting, connecting with uh, the light imagery. And this glory that John attributes to the Lagos starts to connect some dots for us here, okay? Because now at this point, we're getting down somewhere around verse 14, and it's there in verse 14 that John makes that powerful claim I mentioned before, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is that crescendo, right? This is the unveiling of Jesus Christ, the moment when John declares that this Lagos is something very different than the impersonal force of creation that the Greeks imagined. But he is Jehovah God, creator of the universe. And he has chosen to make himself known by coming in a human body and living among us. And John makes this claim about him, that we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. And it's interesting that he uses the word glory there. He says, this came in the flesh, and we think, okay, Jesus now. I could stop calling him Logos, right? Because now he's born, he's got he's Jesus. But on the one hand, um, that word Logos, wor- I mean, that word glory works with his metaphor of light. But when we look at Jesus, uh, the Bible says that there's nothing especially glorious in his appearance as a man. Right? Isaiah 53, 2 and 3, it was a prophecy about Jesus. It says, For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. That doesn't sound very glorious, right? But again, Keep in mind that John is testifying here to what he now knows about Jesus, 60 years later. This is years after Jesus ascended. John has the benefit of hindsight here. And he says, oh yeah, we saw it. We saw, we finally had eyes to see his glory. As we stood there and watched him ascend into the heavens, we saw a glimpse of the glory that he had with the Father before he came. And it was a glory like only the Son could have because he had the glory of the Father. And this glory is the grace and truth of God. The ninth quality as we start to wrap this up is that the Lagos is full of grace and truth. And I want to talk about this one. Uh, I'm going to connect it with number 10, the revelation of God and the revelation of God's grace. Um, Verse 18, skip all the way to the end there. He says, No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. And this is really where it's at. Uh, This is John's big finish to his prologue before he starts the narrative of Jesus' life and ministry. This is John's unveiling of Jesus Christ. John says this Lagos is the one who reveals God. So how does he reveal God? A few things that we've mentioned already. First, He is God in the flesh. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He is the word which was with God and is God made into flesh. He is physical, observable, tangible, human, but divine. And so in that way, he reveals God, right? Colossians 1.15 says that he is the image of the invisible God. If you could make the invisible God look like a form, that's Jesus Christ. He's the firstborn of all creation. The second way that he reveals God is by embodying those qualities of God that make God God, right? Colossians 1.19 says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So he embodies those qualities that make God God. 
And we've already covered briefly what some of those qualities are, such as his eternal nature, his role as creator, his supreme power. And finally, he reveals God by literally being full of grace and truth. Jesus says in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He doesn't just tell the truth, he is the truth. And as the word of God, he is the essence of truth. See, because whatever God spoke came into existence, right? I've said this before. If God said, you know, dogs had six legs, dogs would have six legs. It wouldn't be a lie. He's incapable of lying because anything he says becomes reality. So he is the essence of truth as the word of God. That means, listen, listen, nothing can exist contrary to what God calls it. That is a profound truth to understand. And he has called you a child of God if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ. How dare we ever doubt that? Nothing can exist contrary to what God calls it. And if he's called you something, you are that thing. Regardless of how you feel about it, regardless of how you fail, you are that. John tells us that this quality of God is manifested in Jesus Christ as the word of God. And finally, Jesus Christ makes known the grace of God. And he makes it known through his life and his death. And we talked a lot, I think last week, we were talking a lot about, or two weeks ago, Mark shared a great word last week, uh, about God's grace toward us lately, you know, what grace is. But just a quick recap of grace. Um, It is the favor of God that we can't do anything to earn, but that God shows to us anyway. It is the fact that God gives us eternal life when we deserve death. God gives us peace when we want to make war. God removes his wrath even when we have only ever earned his just wrath. That's the grace of God. And the mechanism for this grace, the mechanism for all of this is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So in a very real sense, Jesus is full of grace. He is the very essence of grace. He is, in the marks of the nails in his flesh, the revelator of God's grace and the revelation of God's grace. The one who makes known in himself the loving, sacrificial love of God towards man. And I I have to ask you, as, as we wrap it up this morning, two questions. And the first one is this, do you know him? Have you met this Jesus? I don't just mean, you know, have you learned about him or heard of him? I mean, do you know him? John's whole point in this is that he is knowable. He's not some abstract power. He's not a philosophy of order. He's the very fullness of God, the one who contains life within himself, the one apart from whom there is no life, the one who is glorious and full of grace and truth. Do you know him? As we look at these, I mean, do we understand who the Lagos is? Second question is, have we given proper glory to him? If this Lagos is all that John says he is, and I would say he is, have we given him proper glory? Have we given him the praise and the worship and the adoration and the obedience that he deserves as the creator of all things, as the one who has life in him, as the light of man, as the eternal one who is with God and was God, as the glorious one who is supremely powerful, full of grace and truth. Colossians 1.18 says, He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Have we made him preeminent in our lives? in our schedules, our our obligations, our leisure time, our life goals, our ambitions, even in our fears and our insecurities? Have we put him in the first place over all these things? If your heart tells you this morning that you haven't, I want to stop you for a moment. Because our reflex is to say, okay, you're right, now I will. Now I'll try harder, right? That's where we always get to. And then we have some synthesizer play in the background, some altar call, and we're like, now I'll try harder. Stop. Stop. All right? Don't say, I'll feel more deeply. I'll do my best to manufacture an emotional response that will make me feel more yielded to God. We can't put the cart before the horse. We are emotional creatures, but God desires that our emotions be a fruit 
of our knowledge of God. He never wants our knowledge of God to come only from our emotions. You understand that? Really important difference. That our emotions are a fruit of the knowledge of God rather than our knowledge of God coming from our emotions. I mean, could you imagine if it did? Nothing is more impermanent than my emotions. Ask my family, right? I mean, my emotions are all over the place. But the Bible says that God never changes. So right there, it tells you if my emotions change all the time, but God never changes, how can I ever arrive at a truth about the unchanging God from my changing emotions? It doesn't work. So if you're here this morning and you realize that you haven't yielded all the territory to Jesus, don't just try to feel more. Look at who he is. Look at the picture that John paints of the Lagos and meditate. And as you meditate on that, on all that he is, uh, even on that short list, uh, he will very, listen what happens. As we meditate on that, as we look to the Christ, what happens, he will very naturally ascend to the place of preeminence in your lives. And then, and then we could worship him with sincerity and in spirit and in truth as he desires. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have revealed yourself through the Lagos, through your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that there is life in him. I pray if there are any here who have not tasted that life, Lord, that they would taste and see that you are good, Lord, that they would taste of that life, that their hearts would be just blown up, Lord, in an understanding of who you are and how you have loved us, how you have showered grace upon grace on us. Lord, I pray that Jesus Christ would have his place of preeminence in our lives over this church, over all that we do. It would be done unto him. I thank you, Lord, that you are good and merciful and that you have called us to yourself when we haven't deserved it. And so I thank you for this congregation, for this church, for this word that you have given us. pray that you would be the center of it all and we would seek first your kingdom we praise you in Jesus' name amen amen thank you for bearing with me i hope that wasn't too dense um we are continuing our service with communion we'll break bread together i hope we can appreciate you know this the, the joy of breaking bread together as a family so we'll continue with that and then with a final song church